Здравствуйте. Hello. I would like to thank the organizers of this conference because for me it is a great opportunity. And uh, today I would like to talk to you about interpreting and about these technologies. One wise man once said that when we are speaking a foreign language, we say what we can, but when we speak our mother tongue, we speak what we, we say what we want. And uh, that is why I'm going to switch to English. I understand you well. If you want to ask a question in Russian, I would understand you. But still, I would like to speak English today. Hello, uh, my name is Barry Olson, and it is a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, I'd like to have an idea of how many of you are interpreters, if you could raise your hand. Okay, great. Because I know we have a lot of translators, localizers here at the conference. And um, interpreting is often looked at as a, a small slice, if you will, of the entire language services pie. And I want to talk to you today about how interpreting is being affected by technology. Translation went through a very rough period with technology beginning about 15 years ago. And I think we have all seen, uh, particularly in many of the presentations yesterday and today, that translation has been transformed. And the days of just being able to use a computer and having dictionaries close by is long gone. Interpreting will be affected by technology in a similar manner. And we need to be prepared for it. So that's why I want to talk to you today about interpreting in the digital world and how you as individual interpreters, as uh, language service providers, company owners, how you can thrive rather than survive and feel as though the world is falling around, falling down around you. Um, as I begin, I want to just explain that I wear a lot of different hats. I am a conference interpreter. I'm also an interpreter trainer at the Monterey Institute of International Studies in California, in the United States. I am a member of the IEEC Training Committee and uh, I'm also the founder of an organization called Interpret America, which uh, organizes a yearly summit in the United States for the sole purpose of trying to raise the profile of interpreting and to provide a forum where all of the different players in the interpreting market can come together. That's individual interpreters, interpreter associations, uh, leadership, companies, and technology providers and end users come together so that we can find ways to tackle the challenges that we face in our industry. And we'll be having our fourth summit next month just outside of Washington, D.C. Now, I'm also an unrepentant technophile. I love technology. I love seeing how technology can be helpful to us. I don't fear it. I think it is a tool that is going to be helpful to us. And my hope is that today, after this presentation, you will look upon new technologies as an opportunity rather than something that is going to replace us. You won't be afraid of Google Translate. You won't be afraid of machine interpretation. You will realize that all of these tools are going to be something that will make interpreting more available and some would even say ubiquitous. Uh, finally, I'm an entrepreneur as well and have been working on a platform to be able to provide remote simultaneous interpretation for teleconferences. So I've got a lot of different projects going on, but they're all very fun. And I'll also say I know I've included too much information in my presentation today. I always do. So I'm going to try and get through it quickly, but we will definitely leave time for uh, questions because I'm very interested to hear what your thoughts are. So 
I've divided things into two uh, stages. We're going to talk about the big picture, what's going on, because interpreting simply fits within a much larger uh, phenomenon, a much larger process, because technology is changing our world in almost every facet imaginable. And then we're going to take some time during the second half of this presentation, and we're going to look at where do we fit in? Where does the individual interpreter that's just trying to gain clients, build relationships, and work to make a living, how do we take advantage of what's going on and how do we prepare? Okay? And then we'll have some time for questions, as I say. So let's get started with the big picture. So I want you to put your thinking caps on. And think about large trends. Don't just think about interpreting. Think about every facet of human endeavor. Why should we care? This is a quote from an American inventor by the name of Charles Kettering. He had, a hundred, I think, 150 or 180 plus patents that he was able to achieve during his career. And he just said, we should all be concerned about the future because we will have to spend the rest of our lives in it. So if you're concerned about the future, you need to be involved in shaping it. Now, think about how the world communicates today. You know, it's difficult. I've got this microphone and I've got a remote and I would pull out my smartphone. But how many of you have smartphones? How many of you have been sending tweets during this conference? A number of people have. How many of you receive texts from your wife, from your children, from your clients? All right. Think about how that is changing the way that we communicate. I've put some other things up here that are being used today to help people communicate across uh, large distances. You've got a telepresence suite up there at the top. You've got Skype, Facebook. That are, all these channels are being used. Skype, I'm sure all of you have used Skype or use Skype on a weekly basis. Um, smartphones, texts, um, different platforms like Adobe Connect, Cisco WebEx, GoToMeeting. All of these provide video, they provide screen sharing, audio uh, conferences as well. Using Bluetooth technology, um, all sorts of things. These have all come about in the last, really, 15 to 20 years, and some of them much less. The smartphone, excuse me, the smartphone came about in 2007. Let's look at some infrastructure here again to think about this in context and what this can mean as interpreting fits into the bigger picture. These are some statistics from the International Telecommunication Union, and the top line is the number of mobile cellular telephone subscriptions. This is in a 10-year period. And to look at the statistics, statistics, it's how many cell phones per 100 inhabitants. This is the world. It went from about 15 in 2001 to 85 per 100 inhabitants. 85% penetration with mobile phones all over the world. Next line. This is a fixed telephone subscription. If we still have a lot of those, the ones that have the wall connectors. It remained basically constant and has fallen just a little bit. It's around 18 per 100 inhabitants. So landlines, as they're known, in many places are disappearing. And in other places, they never existed. And so this technology was used to leapfrog past that. And now people are using mobile phones. The next line, these are individuals that are using the internet. Started at about 8 per 100, and it's now over 30. About 32 people for every 100 inhabitants are using the internet. These last two lines have to do with broadband internet connections. Wired broadband was rolled out in about 2001, and if you look at 2011, it's about 9 per 100 inhabitants. That's not a big penetration rate for Ethernet. But look at when mobile broadband was introduced in 2007. 
That's third generation, fourth generation. What's happening? It has already surpassed wired broadband connections and is about to overtake or probably has already overtaken because these are two years old. The number of people with telephone connections, with wired telephone connections. Think about what that means for communication. If you think about this as a platform for delivering interpreting services, what does that mean? It means we have a much bigger market than ever before. Now, I've got a photo up here. Let me ask you, what do you, what do you think these are? They're headphones. Any guesses to where these headphones are from? These are headphones from the Nuremberg trials. These uh, are actually in the collection of the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. The interesting thing is that a bunch of you are saying, oh, this is from a teleconference, or a telecom conference. Headphones haven't changed that much in interpretation. How much has technology changed for the delivery of simultaneous interpretation in the last 50 to 60 years? Not much at all. There's been some innovation. You've got some nice digital consoles that you'll see. If any of you have ever worked in Brussels or in some other places, the wonderful Bosch equipment. You've got Brailler, uh, Televic. They're, they're nice, but... When push comes to shove, it's the same idea that was around in Nuremberg. We're a little bit behind the curve when it comes to technology. Now, why should we care? Think about it. Communication, as I've shown, and meetings have moved beyond the traditional conference room. We will continue to meet in places like this, in hotels, in conference rooms, in government buildings, that's not going to disappear. However, how many of those people in these conference rooms that we interpret for, that put on headphones, walk out of that conference room and then have a teleconference? Or then need to talk to someone on the telephone? Or need to have some other way to communicate with someone who doesn't speak their language? Now, Traditionally, conference interpreters say, well, if there's no booth, I don't work. Or I don't work with these conditions. These are the conditions I accept. Has communication stopped because of that? We need to think of this as a train that is building up speed, and we have a chance to get on or remain off. But there will come a time when the train will have left the station and we will not be able to do anything. We need to get on the train. Also, current interpreting service models sometimes are not always cost effective, nor are they efficient. They're not convenient either. If someone needs to have a teleconference, let's say between uh, Kiev and New York, and it's only gonna last 30 minutes, and that's all that the uh, executives have time for. Can we really expect them to say, okay, we're going to hire two interpreters. Please bring a booth into the room. Somehow we'll get the connection. And uh, by the way, the interpreters have to be paid a full day. That is not realistic. I mean, it's nice for us if we can get it, but it's not cost effective. And if something is not cost effective and it is not convenient, sooner or later, someone else will find another solution to replace it. Do we want to be the ones that invent those solutions or are we going to let someone else do it for us? That's a question we need to ask. Okay, so interpreting may not be interested in technology. And I've talked to many interpreters who are like, I don't want to know anything about it. Just give me my conditions so I can do my job and leave me alone. Well, technology is interested in interpreting. And many people are working to try and find ways to cross language barriers, with or without us. Let me give you an example. I'm a, a bit of an academic. I teach at the Monterey Institute, as I mentioned. So I had to come up with some kind of complex uh, name for a slide. So this is the complexity perception continuum. 
Okay? Now, what does that mean? It's just a way to try and put this into perspective for you. If you look on the left, you can see this is basically the traditional model for conference interpreting. Um, let's say a multilingual conference. You've got Russian and Ukrainian, which could be sourced locally here in Ukraine. But let's throw in Indonesian. Then let's throw in Spanish. Okay? No Indonesian in Turkey in Ukraine. They'll probably have to come either from Indonesia or the United States. And you're not going to find them where uh, uh, an Indonesian-Ukrainian interpreter. They don't exist, to my knowledge. Prove me wrong, but... So you're going to have to have them working in English, and you'll have relay and everything else, and you've got to fly people from all over the globe. You've got to put them up in hotels. You've got to pay them per diem. You've got to pay them travel, all right? So it is not only expensive, but it's logistically complex. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the perception of the general public that we are now dealing with. And at least in the United States, in Western Europe as well, the idea is, well, can't you just make my smartphone do it for me? In fact, there are commercials with one company called Jibigo, if you've ever heard of it. This, they provide a machine interpretation platform on your smartphone. And it was featured in an Apple uh, iPhone advertisement in a number of countries. And at the end, it says, ah, translation, there's an app for that. Or someone that said, all I needed was my passport and my iPhone. And I could go and communicate with anybody. Those are the expectations that are being set by the regular market. That is what your average citizen thinks in technologically, not technologically advanced, but in societies where smartphones have had significant penetration. People expect, well, just isn't there an app that I can fix it? And then people create apps, and they think, okay, then there's an app for that, and it's all done. So now smartphones can do that. Technology is amazing. <coughs> now, of course, we know that that's not the case. But what are we doing to get that message out? So somewhere we need to find solutions in the middle of that spectrum. Not that the one on the far left is going away. It's not. But it's only going to be used when necessary. There are a lot more kinds of interactions going on across languages that have, shall we say, a lower threshold where it can't cost that much, but if you can find an appropriate way to offer a quality, professional interpreting service that is cost-effective and fair, then there is a lot of room between those two extremes to increase the work that we have available to us. Now, I want people to expand their vision a little bit. That's been a big thing because, again, I've seen too many colleagues put the blinders on and that carrot in front of them is a conference. And it's working in the conditions that I would expect, those same conditions that have existed for 50, 60 years. But we need to take the blinders off and we need to look and see where else we can provide services. Um, Some of you may have heard of this book. If you haven't, I would suggest you that you uh, track it down and read it. It's called The Innovator's Dilemma, When New Technologies Cause Great Firms to Fail. It's written by a Harvard professor by the name of Clayton Christensen. And he did uh, a lot of research about why companies have a difficult time innovating and why change is so difficult for them. And I want to talk to you about two different concepts, innovation and disruption. Now, innovation is a term that's been around for a long time. Disruption only appeared oh, in the lexicon maybe a couple of uh, decades ago and has become even more prominent with what is now known as digital disruption. Innovation is where we look at a product or a service and we figure out how we can tinker with it to make it better. 
So we say, all right, we have interpretation. How can we make the booth more comfortable? Let's include air conditioning. Or, oh, let's make the headphones more comfortable for the interpreter. That's innovation. So you innovate and you have a way to put on wonderful headphones that don't mess up your hair. That's, that would be an innovation. And I'm, of course, being, I'm exaggerating here a little bit. Of course, there are innovations that are much more meaningful than that. But it's something that improves the given, the current service offering. Okay, you're trying to improve that product and service for your existing customers and you're hoping to increase your margin so that you can make more money through that innovation. Now, these innovations have a premium attached to them. So if you're going to buy those nice headphones that aren't going to mess up your hair, it's going to cost you more. Disruption is totally different. Disruption is what we saw in the translation market with the introduction of translation memories and machine translation. As we say in English, that upset the apple cart. Everything was turned topsy-turvy, turned upside down. Because we were seeing how now companies were able to say, well, if you get a fuzzy match, we're not going to pay you as much as we do if you translate a word for the first time. Or if we pull it out of the translation memory, we're only going to pay you one-third of what we would if you were translating that word or phrase. Follow me? That's disruption. It's painful. We don't like it. As interpreters or translators, that hurt. But for the companies, it was great. So disruption seeks to displace by offering a cheaper way or a lower-performing product or service. So there are... Many people, and we'll talk about this during the second half of this presentation, a number of companies that have emerged in recent months, literally, that are trying to find a way to provide quality interpreting service in a new way at a more affordable price. And they are looking to go to the markets where the incumbents aren't interested. Okay? That's where a, a conference interpreter says, well, if I'm not going to be working in a booth, if uh, you're not going to pay my travel, um, if you're not going to give me the conditions that I require, then I'm not interested. But the market says, okay, they're not interested, but maybe there's someone else that is, and these are the conditions that we offer, and if we reach an agreement, then that's acceptable. And the disruptors, and this is the key point here, disruptors are now empowered with tools that they didn't have before. And they are becoming very interested in the language services market for a simple reason. It's a market, and there is an opportunity to serve that market. There was an interesting comment that... Um, um, Pavel Palashenka mentioned yesterday in his opening remarks. And it was that back during the Cold War, it was basically governments, national governments, and then a couple of supranational organizations that were the users of interpreting services. The Soviet government, the U.S. government, the United Nations, NATO, uh, a number of other organizations within the U.N. family, etc., they were the ones that required interpreting services. And in the private market, there really wasn't much of an interest or need for interpreting services. I mean, it did exist, but there wasn't that much interaction. So think back about the platform that I talked about. What kind of interaction is going on today? How simple is it to be able to communicate with someone in another country? Extremely simple and much less expensive than it ever was in the past. Back in the day, back in the 1980s, back in the early 90s, it was difficult to actually get an international line between Moscow and New York. Sometimes you had to wait, and then they said, the line's available, okay, you can now make your phone call. And it was extremely expensive. Now you can do it for free. Think about the power that that means for communication. 
This is why the disruptors want to harness this. Because there's an opportunity to serve a market and make a living doing so. Here's another example of disruptive technology. I've got an iPad. I'm sure there are many iPads or other tablet computers in the audience today. This is a photo that I shot when I was on my way to another job. Um, I think it was last month. Um, no, it was in March. And I was getting something to eat at, a, at an airport. And when I got to the line to pay, there was no more cash register. The iPad was being used as a cash register. Think about this. The iPad's been around for three years. It was released in April um, 2010. Cost between $400 and $900, um, at least in the United States. It's general purpose technology. It is a platform that's set up to be able to basically do whatever a programmer decides they want it to do. Interestingly enough, um, Nick Dan Lyons from Newsweek, this is a uh, weekly news periodical in the United States, uh, he said back then, the whole thing felt like a letdown. Newsweek stopped publishing. They don't exist anymore. The iPad's still around. Think about how the iPad is changing the way we do things. Don't even think about translation or interpreting. It affects journalism, photography, travel, publishing, commerce, healthcare, education, aviation, public libraries, politics, law enforcement, military operations, Religion, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Can we as interpreters say, oh, no, that's not going to touch us. It's touching every other aspect of society. Oh, but not us. We're going to continue to work in a box. We're going to work in hotel rooms. We're going to work in only in the conditions that we set. The technology is rolling forward. We decide if we're going to take advantage of it or not. We have an, a unique opportunity, an opportunity that the translation industry missed. We still have the opportunity to influence how this technology will be used in our profession if we get involved. A couple of thoughts here from some thinkers in the technology world. This is a quote by Michael Saylor. Um, he wrote a book called The Mobile Wave, <clears throat> where he envisions what mobile technology will do to society in general. <clears throat> this is one of the things that helps us understand why we can't ignore technology. If a new thing is technically feasible and is far more economical than the old thing, then it, the new thing will happen sooner or later. There's no stopping it. I see we're at our 30 minute mark, so I've got to speed up. I'm almost on time. Next quote. Ooh, I had two in there. Where we go? Nicholas Carr. Here's the other one. This is the other one to think about, and this is why the new mobile computing platforms are so powerful. When applications have no physical form, when they can be delivered as digital services over a network, the constraints completely disappear. You don't need to have a physical console anymore. You can use something else. You can use an iPad because someone can just write an app for it. You can use a computer. Now, this is where we switch to where do we fit in. Hopefully during this first part of the presentation, you've been able to see just at least to a certain extent, how profound these changes are. Now, some of you may be saying, oh, that's all fine and good. You live in the United States. You have wonderful Internet access. You've got broadband. You have good cell phone reception and service and what have you, but not here in Ukraine. We, we aren't that far along. I would simply say that doesn't matter because it will get better and it will get exponentially better. The thinkers from Silicon Valley are talking about ubiquitous connectivity within a few years. And broadband, they're talking about, I, I saw a, a, a note or a, 
a news article, it was either yesterday or the day before, that with wireless networks, they're actually able to reach one gigabit now. If you can think about how fast that is. And it's going to increase, and we have Moore's Law, and we understand that technology is going to continue to roll forward. So hopefully you're not feeling like some of the words on the screen here, but if you are, I'm going to try and help you not feel that way by the time we finish. Before we begin, I don't know, some of you may know this uh, saying here, abandon all hope, ye who, all ye who enter here. This is from Dante's Inferno. It's not going to be that bad, but I know that some people may fear things. Um, the market has set the bar very high. I've taken some quotes here from uh, promotional material of some of these startup companies that are seeking to create platforms for delivering interpreting services remotely, using the internet or using wireless technology. This is one, the universal translator for the spoken word. Real-time interpretation powered by people on demand in any language, remotely, on any device. Next one, human-powered translation in an instant. Communicate with anyone, anywhere, in any language. And then this is from a recent uh, article. What will a world free from language barriers feel like? We are all about to find out. Now, a lot of this is hype. And frankly, I think that some of these companies have set the bar too high. Because when you say any language, any device, anywhere, anytime, that is a really difficult goal to meet. And the reason why is that everything changes depending on what the situation is. Right now, we have a situation where I'm doing a lot of the talking, and so the interpreters are able to listen to me and work into Russian. But what if there's a lot of back and forth? It changes the requirements. Now, look at this. Uh, I'll just talk about some of these different flavors. It's spring in Kiev. It's hot outside, so I thought we'd talk about different flavors of ice cream. But when you are going to interpret, are you going to interpret using video or just audio? Other issues. Is it going to be consecutive or simultaneous? Most of the solutions for remote interpreting now are consecutive. You have to work back and forth. You have to wait for someone to finish. Then you interpret. Then the other person has to say what they're going to say. And it takes much longer. It's very tedious. Simultaneous over the phone? Well, that's complex because you have to have multiple audio channels. Are you going to have a small interactive group meeting where just 12 people, let's say six that, six that speak Russian and six that speak English, and they're going to be discussing a project and going back and forth? That's going to change the requirements. Is it going to be on demand or are you going to schedule? On demand interpreting, that's a tough thing to do. How are you going to get people available all the time and ready to answer the, pick, uh, the phone or connect however they're going to connect? Scheduling, that can also be complex, but those two, di those two different modes of service um, ha have different requirements. Tele-interpreting, which is what you're seeing a lot in the United States and also in Western Europe, and I'd be interested to know if you've started to see anything like this here, where the interpreter is not present where the people who need the interpreting are. So you have two people, let's say, in a hospital room, and the doctor doesn't speak the patient's language, then the interpreter is brought in either by phone or using a video uh, connection to be able to do consecutive interpreting. Um, is it going to be a one-to-many webinar or a talking head? Have any of you ever interpreted webinars? Okay. It, it's, it's happening. You have someone giving a webinar, they're sitting in their office, and you have 300 people who have connected from around the world. The interpreter connects and is able to interpret just what the talking head is saying and then they control the questions that come in either over a text message or they have a cue and they only give certain people the microphone. That one's much easier because you only have one person talking. There we go. Is it going to be bilingual or multilingual? 
most of the work, and, and this is an interesting thing, with the Russian market and also with the Spanish language market that I work with a lot in uh, the Americas, it's bilingual. You're expected to be able to go in both directions. And I'm assuming that that's probably here in Ukraine as well. That's a different skill set than you find with most of the interpreters who are working in international organizations. They work only into their native language. And so that changes things, again. And if it's multilingual, it becomes pretty complex. Remote participation. Are the interpreters going to be at the venue and then they're connecting people from other countries? Changes things. And is the interpreter team going to be together or apart? They may be in the same place, but I've worked on teleconferences where I have had my booth mate in Texas in the United States, and I was working from my office in California. How do you know when to switch? How do you work that out? It, it adds complexity to the whole equation. And then you've got a whole issue of endpoints, and I'm starting to get a little bit too, too technical here. But are you going to use voice over IP? Are you going to be using traditional switched telephone networks? Are you going to be using video and some people connecting with audio, some people connecting with Skype, others connecting with Adobe Connect, and someone else on a telepresence system? It adds greater complexity, but this is what's starting to happen in the market. Okay, the cloud. I'm sure you've all heard of cloud computing. Cloud computing has made it possible to take physical infrastructure and make it virtual. What I've got up here is actually a um, picture of a virtual interpreter console. This is one that my company uh, actually designed. And it works just like the console that the interpreters have in the booth here in the room. You're able to switch languages, switch directions as necessary in bilingual um, mode, or it can be used for a multilingual teleconference where different interpreters are assigned to different channels and it works just like the equipment where a delegate can flip through channels and choose their language. And it also provides for relay, so if you don't understand one of the languages, you can take relay from another booth. Um, simple, but it all resides, it's software. And if we need to change something, think about this again. This is another principle why we are going to see innovation speed up the way things are done. If you look at this console down here, it's a wonderful console by Bosch. Let's say I get it and I, I then tell Bosch after about six months, you know what, I don't like where you put the microphone button. Can you move it? Or, you know, I, I don't like the, the, where you've put the volume control. Can we move it to the other side? They'll say, I'm sorry, our form factor is set. We'll think about it for our next iteration of the product in five years, but we can't change that now. If you tell me you don't like where the mute button is on this virtual console, we can change it in 24 hours. If there's a problem, we can update the software automatically. It looks a little 1980s, we know. But we haven't even bothered to get to that point yet because we want to make sure that it works well. And once it works well, then we can put a pretty skin on it. We can make it look modern. and We can give it shading and everything else. But right now, that doesn't matter. That's superfluous. But we can do that. You can see we're already in. Uh, we've gone through a number of iterations. This is 1.7.9. That's the power of software and having systems reside in the cloud. The, the innovation cycle and is so much faster. So let me talk about some of these startups now because our time's disappearing quickly. All of these icons up on this screen are for actual companies that either have a solution on the market now or are working on a solution and it's in beta and they're looking for interpreters to try it out and to test it and give feedback and see what they can do. Um, I'll go through them quickly. Start up here at the upper uh, left, Capiche.pro. This is a company that is a startup. They've only been around a few months. They're based in Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States. They are seeking to create a platform that makes it possible for interpreters 
to work using video connections using a smart device. It could be a smartphone, it could be an iPad, it doesn't matter. And they will vet the interpreters, make sure that they're professional and put them into a database so that their clients can choose what interpreter they want. Or interpreters can use the system and bring their own clients. So this is one thing you should start looking for. You're here in Ukraine, you're thinking, well, how do I compete with people in other countries? How can I offer my services? This flattens everything right now. If you use this platform and you have clients that use it and like it and you're able to provide the kind of service that they're looking for, that's how it's done. International payments are not that complicated now. Dubjoy, this is an interesting concept. They provide a platform to do uh, voiceover for videos. And you can do it on your smart device. If I had time, I could show you how it works. Um, I'm looking at it for teaching purposes, to be able to have students test remotely and then upload the file and then I can listen to the file. Um, but it's also, if you think about how much video is being produced today, most of it's in English. And there's a lot in other languages. People want to know what these videos say. So you've got subtitling platforms like .sub that make it possible to subtitle videos. And Dubjoy is looking to be able to provide a platform to do this very simply using a smartphone. And it brings down the costs tremendously. So if you're involved in voiceover, another opportunity. Verbalize it. This company was on national television in the United States last night on a, on a show called Shark Tank where they go and they ask for uh, startup capital. I haven't been able to watch it yet, but I heard that things went very well for them. Um, they have, through other channels, been able to already garner 1.5 million in startup capital to be able to develop their solution that works on a number of platforms. Their solution's working today. You could sign up and work for them now. Now, again, you have to look at how it works. Are you willing to work for the terms and conditions they set up? But it's there, and they already say that they have more than 3,500 interpreters working for them. Stratus Video, in the United States, they provide video solutions for medical uh, interactions. Doctors now carry around iPads. They come in, oh, my patient speaks Hmong or Vietnamese. They go to the app, they make the request. With most languages, they're able to connect within seconds, sometimes minutes. The interpreter, they set the pad right down, it has the camera, they see the two people that need to in have interpreting, and the interpreter works right there remotely. That's working right now. ZipDX, my company, we have built this platform that makes it possible to do simultaneous remote interpreting for teleconferencing and for, uh, for webinars. We also have been working for the last two years with the ITU for remote participation. Um, if any of you are interested, I'd be happy to share more with you about what we do as well um, after. Interpreter Intelligence. This company, based out of Silicon Valley, has created a scheduling system for interpreting. And you can go to it, check it out if you're an agency. If you're having trouble scheduling interpreters for the many assignments, in the United States and in other countries where there are large immigrant populations that need services, either in the justice system or in the healthcare system, these appointments last 30 minutes, two hours, and they're all over the place, and it can be a nightmare to schedule. This program seeks to resolve that. Babelverse, they've been around for a few years. They're trying to provide remote simultaneous interpreting. Um, Glot is a company out of Uruguay, and they're trying to replace interpreters where you don't have to put them in the room, and what they want to do is keep interpreters working in their offices, and so we actually wouldn't have to have any interpreters in the room here, and they would actually co connect via a uh, remote connection using the Internet. They also are using smartphone technology to turn a smartphone into a, uh, into a receiver, just like the ones we have here in the room. Um, Interprety, this is a really interesting name. Uh, Interprety is actually based in Eastern Europe. It's functioning now. Have a similar platform to that of Capiche, and uh, they have it all set up so that they've integrated with PayPal, and so that is how people are paid. 
Clients uh, have to uh, sign up for the service, know what the service is going to cost. That money goes into an escrow account and is held onto until the interpreting takes place. Once it's concluded and the client's happy, then interpreting releases the money to the interpreter. So it's actually held in an, in an escrow account as a way to try and address the issues of payment that we often have to deal with, with clients. So these are just companies that have emerged in the last couple of years. And they are all looking for interpreters, not locally, because they can work internationally. They can work as long as you have a good connection. It doesn't matter where you are. So these are the kinds of tools that I see empowering interpreters to begin to take their services to new market segments that did not exist in the past. I wish we had more time so that we could look at some of them, but uh, I'll be able to get you some information here at the end. Um, I had hoped to talk to you about some wideband audio issues, but we're not going to have time. Let me just say this. Audio quality is probably the biggest challenge when it comes to remote interpreting. And there are reasons for it. I'll go through this quickly. Uh, human speech ranges from about 80 hertz all the way up to 14, uh, 14,000 hertz. Okay? Traditional narrowband telephones like the ones in your homes that are still connected using copper wire or um, connected to a traditional telephone system, their limit is between just above 300 hertz and about up to 3,300 hertz. So that means all of this down here is lost. And all of this is lost as well. You simply, physically, you cannot hear it. Wideband telephone technology, which has been introduced, um, was introduced a few years back, has been able to effectively uh, double the range available on uh, wideband HD telephones. Um, voice over IP technology also provides high definition audio. Um, and I would just say Skype is not the best example of voice over IP. So don't think that Skype is the only platform. There are many others that are much better and much more dependable. Um, just to give you some examples, this shows you a spectrograph. You can see where consonants, just you can't hear them on a regular telephone. This is an example of someone who was uh, put in jail in the United States a few years back. And this is a fictitious conversation, but he would say, I told them to pass the books for distribution, not to pad them. Padding the books meaning that they were um, not, they were fictitious and they had incorrect information in them. But if you look at the D and the S on this um, graph, you'll notice that they can only be distinguished above 3,300 hertz. Your mind, the, the human mind is an amazing thing. Oh, there we go. Is it back? Now you can hear me. Uh, you are able to use context and divine what it is that someone most likely said in a noisy room because you can filter out some of the noise and you can decide whether it was a D or an S that was pronounced. Now, think about this. In English, it's an issue because we have consonants like that. But think about it for the Slavic languages. If you think about all the shipyashi and, and all of the consonants that you can't really even hear on a regular telephone. How important it is to have good sound. Um, this just shows that standard definition audio, you would normally have in a regular telephone call about 40 ambiguities per minute. That means that there are 40 sounds that in one minute that you could not understand, but you figured them out from context. When you go to high uh, definition wideband audio, you can actually drop that by... Uh, to a power of 10 and it drops to four ambiguities per minute. So you can see that that's, that's an important thing. So as I wrap up here, this is what I would recommend you do. Stay on top of technology trends. You can do it. Read about them. Ask yourself, how could this affect interpreting? How could it affect multilingual communication? Stay up to date. Read. Experiment. Ask questions. Talk to colleagues. Um, look at these companies, see what they're doing, send them emails. We have an unprecedented opportunity. Those companies that I showed you on the screen want to work with interpreters. They want their feedback. They want to do it right. The companies on the screen 
they realize that machine interpreting won't be good enough. There are other companies, you've got Google Translate, you've got Microsoft, you've got IBM, um, there's an, a Jibigo that I had mentioned. They're trying to do it all through databases, voice recognition, speech to text, and they're not even including the human element. And they're going for another market segment. These other companies want to work with us. And if we work with them, we're going to be able to influence how these products develop. Remember how easy it is to change something. And now they're willing to listen to us. We don't want to repeat the mistakes of the translation industry. Finally, evaluate the opportunities, look at it and say, oh, you know, this looks like it's something that I want to try and add to my service offering. I continue to work uh, in conferences, uh, but I'm going to see if I can complement using one of these platforms. Because it's better to have a lot more irons in the fire or have more options available to you than to be relying on just one source of work. As I think we all understand diversification is a good principle. So <clears throat> I'll, I'll wrap up with this. Technology-driven change is inevitable, but at every stage we can exert a measure of control over how it plays out. For all the possibilities that communication technologies represent, their use for good or ill depends solely on people, on us. Forget about all the talk that machines are going to take over. What happens in the future is up to us. And this is a quote from Eric Schmidt and Jared Cohen, a new, uh, Eric Schmidt being the um, CEO of Google. And Jared Cohen is a uh, well-known uh, political scientist, commentator. They've written a book about how technology is going to change humanity. And they recognize that really it, how it will change humanity will depend on us. And how this is going to change interpreting will also depend on us. Um, if you would like more information, I've actually prepared a uh, sheet of useful links with access, uh, links to all sorts of information. Um, if you will give me your business card or write down your email legibly <laughs> on a piece of paper, I will send this out to you um, in PDF format and it's got uh, two pages of links to these companies, to articles that have been written about this, uh, to technology so that you can do further reading. So with that, дякую, спасибо, thank you very much. I have a question. Uh, you know, you're describing things which may seem fantastic to many people in this room. And we know about the digital divide between the countries and sometimes inside the countries between various social and other groups. And I believe that uh, speaking about translation and interpreting technology, especially interpreting technology, because for translation technology we have computer-aided translation tools which have already been used somehow also in this country. But all these things, you know, we are having younger colleagues here who listen to it and think, well, some great Americans inventing great things over there, some colleagues there are using it, but we'll probably never use it. We'll, we'll never see uh, even 10% of all that. Do you think uh, we are talking about global trends, or is there a danger that uh, it, it will result in just a greater digital divide now in this area? No, I don't think it's going to be a greater digital divide. And yes, I do think it's a world trend, put simply. Uh, a very simple question. You said that the translators made mistakes. What were the mistakes or the main mistake that they made that uh, um, kind of made it worse for the translators? Because if, if it was a mistake, it means that uh, things are not going as well for them with these new technologies as they should. So what was the main mistake that the translators made as regards technology? Well... My understanding, and uh, the person to really talk to about this is Yost, um, because he understands it very well, but the mistake was to not embrace technology. When the first translation <clears throat> memory tools were coming and being introduced, the translators basically said, no, we don't do that. 
we're not going to use those. And so they then went to the translation agencies. And the agencies saw that, oh, this could be very helpful. And the agencies began to use it. Um, but the tool creators didn't stop there. They then went to the end users. Okay? If the interpreter, excuse me, the translators would have taken advantage of, of translation memory and many of the other tools in the beginning, they could have influenced the way that these tools were developed to their favor. That didn't happen. You kind of expedited the speech recognition. There was a presentation of a VP of Microsoft last year in November, if you remember. It was in TEDx China. In, in China. It was English uh, into Chinese uh, in his own voice. It wasn't only speech recognition, but instant translation. Do you think that ha that, that technology has no future? Because what we were talking here is uh, the same classical model. I mean, the interpreter is somewhere. Mm -hmm. Technology only improves that or uh, breaks distances, so it doesn't really matter wh where you physically are. But uh, that technology doesn't involve any interpreting. So it's not machine translation, it's something more. It, as they described it, it was like a, a leap forward, it was a different concept. Can you comment on that? Be happy to. Um, I would say a few things. First. Um, the technologies that I did present are, are there to help deliver the interpreting service. There's a whole other discussion that we could have about how technology could facilitate the work of the translator. What if speech to text becomes so good that we could see it go from the original language and then have it pop up on a screen in front of us and then the words that we didn't know we could simply touch them uh, with our finger and the definition would appear as we're interpreting. Be interesting, wouldn't it? I mean, there are all sorts of applications that we could think about uh, to help the interpreter. Now, going back to what Microsoft showed, um, I'm not going to say that we will never reach artificial intelligence. I don't know that I'm going to see it in, in my lifetime to where it would be able to replace a human interpreter, but I'm not going to say, oh, that's never going to happen. It could. Um, my experience with demonstrations by any large company is that they are carefully orchestrated, carefully practiced, and very controlled so that they can easily make people be impressed. I would just juxtapose what you saw with Microsoft in China that was had a pretty big wow effect with what happened when Google tried to introduce its uh, speech recognition with Google Translate in Germany. It didn't work. You know, and they were, oh, well, hmm, normally it works. Uh, technology sometimes doesn't work. And that goes for any of these as well. So uh, more than anything, I would just like to leave you with a sense of optimism. Don't be afraid of these technologies. We're not going to be replaced tomorrow or in five years unless something amazing happens. And frankly, if it does, that would be so amazing. I think the last of our worries are going to be whether we're going to be able to continue to work as interpreters. So embrace the technologies. Look into them. Find out how they could be used and be one of those people that's on the forefront because you'll have an opportunity to not only garner more work but to also shape how our profession is going to be practiced in the coming years. Спасибо.